and welcome to Dungeons and Drama Nerds. I'm Todd Brian Backus, and I'm here with Percy Hornack and Nicholas Orvis. I'm Percy. And I'm Nick. To discuss the ways that playing Dungeons and Dragons, or any tabletop role-playing game, is like and unlike performing. So... When you look at the idea of of performing as an actor and performing in a tabletop role playing setting, playing a tabletop game, there are some very obvious similarities and and overlaps. You are doing voices, you're playing a character, you are ostensibly trying to achieve an objective within the scope of the story. Um, You are improvising, perhaps. There are some very obvious things that you're doing as a player in a tabletop game that overlap with the idea of being a performer. Um, And also, you are, you have an audience, either the other people at the table, or if you are a, a streamer or a podcaster, the, the people who are who are consuming those things. Um, and sort of to draw out this idea of the tabletop game as a as a performance, as a a play, if you will. Um, I think there is a, a perception of these two very distinct roles. You have a player, and you have the DM or GM who could occupy a director role or a a featured role that is different and distinct from that of the other players. And I think there is a perception sometimes that this DM or GM person has a, um, a a dominance or or a superiority maybe to the rest of the table that I think is not necessarily true, but, uh, I'm open to, to discussion of. Yeah. Um, well, I think, I think in some ways, um, director is maybe too strong of a role that I would put on them and instead see them more as uh, kind of a stage manager, like organizing the transitions from one scene to another, um, trying to facilitate all of the things happening between all of the player performers um, and going through uh, while they're also often um, the author of the thing as well, which helps with some of that direction and stage managing, um, trying to get through like, what are the, the beats, uh, that we hope to get through or need to get through. And also weighing that against like, what are the, the things that the players are doing and how does that change that? And how do we nimbly, um, sort of reconfigure not to railroad, but like to figure out like, oh, I thought we were going to be doing something like X. And instead, the players seem very interested in Y. And how do we do that instead or in addition to? Yeah, I think that's kind of the problem with the idea of DM as director is there's that sense of like they are right or they know they they have authority to tell other people what they're doing in, in a way that I think is uh, unproductive and untrue in, in a tabletop setting, because I think ultimately a good DM is responsive to what other people are, are bringing to the table and they are curating the experience around that. I really like the idea of the DM or GM as a stage manager. Um, that feels more true to me than the idea of them as a director. Um, although it also, they are definitely also often a writer um, just in the nature of a lot of you know homebrew homebrew games are created wholly by the gm uh but i also like to think of them just as kind of another player you know all of all of the people are in the in a game are playing together to kind of generate narrative and really a gm is just in a slightly different role in that they have like very different tools at their disposal <laughs> to generate a story than the players do who have kind of one like super detailed role. The GM has the ability to be like, okay, I'm going to be a, a helpful townsperson now because that's the way I see to like move the story forward. <laughs> and I think Dungeons and Dragons is interesting because it gives so much power is not the right word, but it, it gives so much responsibility for how things happen and what is available to the players to this one individual um i think there are other systems that are intended to be a lot more collaborative between everybody at the table but dungeons and dragons sort of puts the dm in this very very different role almost like flipped from what the players are doing where the players have this one very specific task which is play this character and react to the world around you whereas the the gm is creating the whole world around around everybody else and i think yeah, it's really easy to forget that the DM is also there to play and is also ostensibly w- would like to have fun along with everybody else. Mm-hmm. 
I wonder if some of that comes from, um, as we've talked about earlier, Dungeons and Dragons is kind of an evolution of war games and war gaming. And because of the complexities, uh, instead of moving from like army versus army to individual hero characters, um, Gary Gygax and oh, heck, Dave Arneson, that one. They they devised this like arbiter role um, who serves as like the rule keeper um, because the game is so complicated and we don't expect all of the players to know all of how everything could possibly interact. Um, we kind of foist that on the GM. Uh, and I think in some ways it leads to this like all knowing, all powerful, blah, blah, blah um, that we see from some GMs. Whereas something that, as we'll discuss in other systems, um, having something that's a little more like this is the person who helps like structure the narrative a little more, um, but is still here to play with all of you is a very interesting and different sort of place to be. Yeah, I think in original editions of D&D, there was very much like an antagonistic relationship between the GM and the players just by the nature of, of what the system was created to do the kinds of stories that the system was created to tell. Like you have tomb of horrors, which is very much intended to be the GM who has all the secrets is laughing behind the screen while everybody else doesn't know what's going on and is about to walk into a spiked pit. And I think that referee rule arbiter sort of role has evolved into what I think in kind of current games of D and D is the most of like the, the most useful function of a DM, which is the person whose job it is to just decide what the rule is. Even if it's not necessarily the rule written on page X of the dungeon master's guide, it is very helpful to have one person who is designated as like, they call the shots about how things are going to be. And we're going to move on. It's not unique to dungeons and dragons, but thinking about different models of telling collaborative stories, it is an un. Dungeons and Dragons, especially fifth edition, I think um, the edition that if you're playing D&D today, you're probably playing is occupying a kind of odd spot where there are a lot of rules like written down in the rule book and accessible. But also there are deliberately, you know, very large blank spaces, especially compared to a lot of other a lot of previous editions of D&D where there were exhaustive rules for almost everything that you could like reasonably imagine doing albeit in more limited circumstances so it strikes me that this is an interesting tension in a game that you know it's conflict resolution mechanic the d20 is based on having this kind of like minute mathematical technique but it is also carving out this big open space and saying okay in this space where we have not written anything it is up to this one person to decide this is how the D20 can interact with uh, whatever you have decided you want to do as a player now. Yeah, I think it's interesting that the DM, because I think the main job that a DM has aside from role playing as the world and other NPCs is setting how difficult things are. And I think what's fun then is you can turn that idea around and as a player, um, you know, you can sort of justify a dice roll or you can justify the success or failure of a given action uh, in a in a moment. Yeah, because I think that is if we're looking at playing D&D as a form of improvisation, which it is the big like tenet of improv that comes into it, I think is justification um, because you have this enormous unknown, which is what are you going to roll on the die and will it succeed or fail? Um, and it's, I think, all about just folding that into the story and and moving forward um, based on whether or not you could do the thing that you wanted to do. And the ways that we do that as players, I think, are, are super fascinating. And as improvisers, um, I'm thinking about the kind of like different layers of character and player that happen in any given moment of a game. Um Okay, I'm putting on my, like, nerd hat now for a minute. Um, there are some dramaturgs, uh, European dramaturgs named Setkowski and Lehman. I'm probably butchering their names. They, they were working on um, a digital game that they were trying to kind of determine how narratives worked in digital spaces. And they came up with this four-part schematic that if you look up their work, which I'll 
remember the full title of and we'll put it in the episode notes. Uh, but if you want to look up their work, they have a four part schematic with a very intimidating uh, chart graphic. But um, what it basically comes down to, as I recall, is that there's in any given moment, we as players are shuttling back and forth between what's happening to our character and what's happening to us. And then also uh, what's happening kind of like within the narrative and what's happening in the interface of the game. So if my character, Joe the fighter, is bitten by a dragon and loses his arm, I'm simultaneously dealing with, okay, Joe took five points of damage, which means he's lost this much of his total health. Also, what's Joe's reaction to losing his arm <laughs> to the dragon bite? Also, what's my personal reaction to this character I crafted losing his arm to the dragon bite, which may be like very visceral sometimes this is the better example of this is in like a video game like dark souls when there are jump scares that actually affect you as the player even if they you know your character is like a i've never actually played dark souls but (laughs) but, (laughs) i assume that the character is like a a burly a burly man person who is not Um, scared by demons could be as one of the one of the gamers on this (laughs) podcast i feel obligated to inform you uh often you are of pretty regular build in dark souls um yeah it's it's uh interestingly not the power fantasy that many western rpgs are but i feel like we're getting off track so let's just segue back into that uh player as performer and audience well, I think I think an interesting sorry example of um, of this layering is the idea of metagaming. Um, I know it came up in in our game. There is a moment where a player who is himself just as a person incredibly familiar with specific monsters and specific lore of Dungeons and Dragons. He, Chris Dierkson, knows so much about certain creatures, um, but his character, who knows. Who knows what Chadrick Bosley knows and doesn't know about a specific piece of lore or a specific setting or a specific creature. Um, So I think it's hard sometimes as a player to reconcile what you know with what your character knows. And that extends beyond like really incredibly specific Dungeons and Dragons lore. But also I, the player, know that this other person in the party has this secret, right? Or that this other person in the party um, snuck away from camp while everybody was asleep, but my character has no idea. Um, and it can be hard to, to separate those things sometimes, especially because I think this is a, a game where we are really invested in our characters and we are really, um, in a, in a situation where we identify with them. So there's this really incredible book that I read that the title gave me pause when I initially picked it up. It's called the ultimate RPG gameplay guide, which I was like, Okay, sure. Um, But James D'Amato, the author, has uh, made some really, really excellent points in it. And part of it he talks about in this weird nebulous place as both player and performer and audience, because we can metagame, because we do know things that our characters don't, um, how do we try to assess both ways to play moments like that where like maybe this character snuck off to do something and they're excited for an upcoming scene where they get to reveal some big thing to the party and like how do you play that in a way that doesn't annoy your other party members who desperately want to know uh but satisfies them with this like really exciting and emotionally relevant or poignant or whatever uh, moment where they get to learn that information that you and the DM have shared separately, privately. Um, And like, how do we negotiate as the other players who are left out of this exchange, um, but knowing that there was a thing and wanting so desperately to like get that information because that's part of the performance and part of the show that is this collaborative role playing game. And so like, how, how do we negotiate those things? And he offers some suggestions on like ways to do this well, um, but he doesn't have a definitive like this is how we can postulate about 
um, players, performer, and audience. Uh, I I feel like there's interesting subtleties there. There's what's happening um, when we talk about metagaming. There's kind of the like what's happening within the party and what's happening between the party and the world around them. And I and I, th- I think my feelings about it are all like are are kind of unformed in both respects. I think with your party, it very much depends on the game and the and both the game system and the actual table and kind of what everybody's getting out of it. You know, if you're playing a game that is, you know, kind of narratively driven and character driven and with a bunch of people who all like know each other well. And if you know that you all want the same thing then it can be really great to have a scene where you like sneak off and do some se- something secret and reveal something to the other players. Um, but not everybody is into that. <laughs> um, yeah, like I would definitely be su- like, I think there is sometimes it hits a point where it's like, okay, who is this for? Um, you know, what are you hoping to get out of it? Because it's not an individual experience. It's a group experience. Um, and there are some, um, for example, in Critical Role, there are times when they will send everybody but one person away from the table and do a one-on-one scene between the DM and a player. Uh, and then there are times where there will be really huge reveals of backstory information or secret information that is happening where the characters, the other characters in the party don't know what's going on and don't aren't receiving this information, but the players are. Um, and I think that starts to enter sort of another layer of the of this idea that we're talking about more generally where also you as a player playing in a game of for example Dungeons and Dragons are also an audience member because you aren't necessarily directly involved with every single thing that's going on at the table and also you are you are there to consume a story and you are there to receive an experience so i think not only is there Is there pressure to perform just in general because the expectation of a role playing game is that you're playing a character and acting, Um, but also there are other people there who um, will feed off of your of your energy and react. And that can be a really exciting, fun part of it. Mm -hmm. And I think to to your point, there's there's a difference between uh, when you're performing for yourself, which does happen at at tabletop tables like sure it does. does happen where it definitely does <laughs> where someone is performing for themselves versus performing for the group and um i think a thing that we often lose sight of in role playing like very often we're worried about like what does my character do what does my character think um and i think a question that's interesting for the story and like maybe this is something else entirely um but i think uh, a question that's interesting is like what makes a compelling narrative in this moment like not just yes my character who uh for instance like well mm, i don't want to put too many words in your mouth whatever say i'm gavin the glorious and i feel glorious about things and i'm like doing things that are righteous and true is that always the most interesting thing for him to be doing? Or are there other times where like him being slightly less glorious is perhaps more interesting for the table? Um, and what does that say? Yeah. And I think circling back to, to what Nick had said about, it's about what your, what your table wants. I think there are some tables who are very much there to play a game. Um, and maybe the fun part of playing the game is doing what your character would do in that situation, even if it's not the most strategically sound thing to do or the smartest thing to do. Um, And I think there are some people for whom it's not about crafting a story for us. It certainly is. Um, But I think, yeah, I think that's really interesting just to think about us as players kind of actively trying to construct a thing that is interesting um, and offer for everybody else at the table to pick up on and yes and uh to continue with sort of the improv jargon Mm -hmm. i can think of thinking about the tables i've i've played at three kind of big stripes offhand all and all of these you know usually coexist actually at the table just in different degrees but there's the kind of like most gamey uh you know like beer and pretzels game of you know, I like games, I like dice, and I have showed up to slay some monsters with my sword. 
Like, that's one kind of style of gameplay. There's the, like, off-the-wall uh, style of gameplay that a character like Gavin kind of exists in that's like, this is going to be, like, ridiculous improv fun that, where I'll just, like, screw around. Not, not, not just screw around, but, like, we're telling a story, but the story is lighthearted and, like, an escape from reality. And then there's... You know, also, sometimes people want to take on a more, like, serious, dramatic story, maybe with some, I don't know, like, some moral dilemmas or gray areas or something, you know, hard choices that characters have to make, which can be super interesting. And I think all of those coexist, but tables usually kind of, like, converge on one for the tone of, uh, a game and it can feel jarring when you have a character from column B for example in a column C game that can feel <laughs> uh, strange or vice versa. It actually has made me think of something um, that I I think is a, a fuller topic for a later episode but I think sort of ties into this idea of, of layers of player and character because I think my personal experience of that column C type of game um, is like a very real like Many people that I know, including myself, have been using tabletop role playing games and playing characters to explore gender identity. Um, it's a sure. really I found really valuable tool for being able to try on personas and try on different modes of being, even though you yourself aren't changing at all. Um, and I think that is another really fascinating thing is the idea of like this is especially like this is a fantasy world. This is a world where you can be whoever you want to be. Um, and you are able to to try things and, and explore things in a, in a space where nothing is really real. So there aren't any sort of lingering effects or consequences. I think that's one of the fundamental things of like one of the fundamental appeals of play. Right. Like it's I get to go take take this risk or. Uh, OK, now I think I'm paraphrasing Adam Alston, who's a, a performance scholar who writes about immersive theater in the uk go look him up um but he talks about like the simulation of risk mostly in immersive theater but i think there's something very similar in tabletop role-playing games where it's like i get to try out the idea of you know fighting evil or I, like you could you could really choose any situation that would arrive in a like, I don't know, asking my monster date to prom, whatever. <laughs> um, I get to try that out in a space that does, like you said, doesn't have consequences. And so I can kind of experiment with myself and my identity and my comfort levels safely there. Yeah, me in real life is never going to seek out a dragon and stab it with a sword. Absolutely not. No, thank you. <laughs> uh, I do not have hit points. I just have limbs. Um, <laughs> Um, but I think this sort of opens up a broader question of like, what, what, what is role playing anyway? Yeah. Um, so role playing both in games and in theater is very literally playing a role. Um, but looking at human culture, it's something that happens, uh, across all cultures, across all age ranges. It's the sort of thing that like the play acting that kids do, um, which is a very like normal part of the human experience. And through tabletop role playing games and other avenues, we're able to uh, kind of immerse ourselves in different identities and different personas in fun ways that imitate the sort of stuff that we did often as kids. Um, there was this article, well, a uh, dissertation, uh, I was reading, uh, you know, a casual 270 page casual article, dissertation, right? um, uh, Catherine Lynn Whitlock, um, who this is her doctoral dissertation and I'm assuming she got her doctorate. Um, it's going to be real she, awkward if she didn't when we yeah, say it'll be awkward. um, but she starts with talking about the way um, the play acting that we do as kids um, 
is often uh, kind of like made consummate in the use of mask play and that like by fully immersing yourself and changing your figure um, to perform a role is kind of the height of that. And we see that in theater, uh, sometimes with literal mask work, uh, but also in the way in which we uh, apply makeup to change the contours of our face and to make our visage look different but also people bring this into uh, tabletop games as well uh, there are some people that in order to perform their role uh, they find it easiest if they are also in some way shape or form presenting that character uh, physically as well it makes it easier to kind of like line up with that um, and so you have less dissonance between player and performer and character yeah i i think one of the interesting things about this question to me is like what is so talking about masks um a lot of a lot of mask the idea of mask is a kind of sublimating yourself into another character and i guess what i i'm interested in and my, my kind of like uh stump speech position <laughs> would, would be that like I, I i think there is an interesting way that role playing fundamentally is about kind of thinking about the world through the lens of this other character which doesn't necessarily mean that you have to like perform perform in the performative sense as that character you know it's a it becomes a question of constantly thinking okay what would what would x's response to this situation be um i i feel like that's kind of at the core of role playing is that imaginative projection into another character yeah this reminds me of um when i was researching a show last year i did it was a show that had to do with virtual reality and this is not virtual reality but um there's a, a lab at stanford um called the virtual human interaction lab and they make these simulations where you do vr and you play like you are in the in the shoes of a person who is being served an eviction notice or who is experiencing racism or um things like that um, and it, they found, um, and I'm paraphrasing enormously, like many, many years worth of research, but, um, <laughs> they found that they found that, um, these experiences increased empathy, uh, in the people who were undergoing them, um, which is in and of itself a fascinating, interesting thing. But I think what it says about the idea of role playing or of stepping into a role is that we are wired in such a way that it is really easy for us to identify, uh, with a character and we are able to really easily put ourselves in the situation of, okay, how would I feel if this was happening to me? What would I do in response to this situation, even if it is not a real thing that is happening to us as people? Yeah. 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 Well, and I think um, something that I find interesting with, with role-playing games in general is that like often very new players um, will play like a slightly fantastic version of themselves, but usually uh like writ large the character is them um and mm. often it i think it takes a lot of doing to be able to step into like an entirely different fictional person's head and like how would they react versus how would i react um which is kind of like a next level blah 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 um but i think that this is also true in theater is that like often um especially when performers are particularly young as many actors start in high school um they're often typecast into very specific like ah the handsome one who is charming we shall cast them as the lead um ah that kid who actually has good comic timing perhaps we should make them the comic role um and so we see this and it it becomes uh easier to step out of those very like narrow uh boundaries of our own personas um as you play more whether in a theater or in a tabletop game but yeah well and i think what's cool is that D sort of has and i have some qualms that i can save those hot takes for another time with the ability score system in general but um i think though neat thing that ability scores do is not only do we have the functional like this is a number that tells you how good you are at doing a thing so when you try to do that thing later we know whether you'll succeed or fail at it but also you have these six really specific traits um that tell you 
what your character is like. Are they really book smart? Um, you know, are they nimble? Are they super strong? Are they good at interacting with other people? And I think it's nice to have that guideline for when you begin to step out of a character that is very much like you um, so that you're able to say, oh, well, my charisma score is low. So maybe my first tactic in a situation would not be trying to talk my way out of it or trying to persuade this person to do what I want them to do. Not only mechanically because my score is low, so I am less likely to succeed at it, but also, you know, this specific mechanic is telling me the player maybe this would not be this person's initial instinct or if your charisma score is low and your wisdom score is low maybe your first impulse is always to try to talk your way out of it (laughs) very good point um and that can be hard in a metagaming sense too right if you're playing a low intelligence character but you yourself are super good at sudoku puzzles um and you encounter a sudoku style puzzle in a dungeon It can be hard to reconcile. Okay, me as the player super wants to get on this puzzle, but me, my character would maybe not be so good at it. And you see this a lot with like players playing low intelligence characters who are solving like a riddle and the player knows immediately what the answer is. But they're like, oh, is it true to my character that they would get this right away? Or sometimes the reverse. (laughs) Or sometimes the reverse. But I think, and I think it depends on your table how much that matters, because I know there are certainly many tables, especially people who are not as invested in the acting challenge of performing a tabletop role-playing game character, um, where it doesn't matter, and you just do the thing that, that keeps the game going. But if you are invested in the idea of, like, I'm playing this character as true to this character as I can possibly be, and I've laid out their objectives, and I've laid out what tactics they will use first um it can be it can be tricky to to navigate that oh man do players make like performance beat breakdowns i don't think so i might just be i I might just be a little a little crazy (laughs) um well and i think uh there's there's something to be said uh to segue a little bit here uh for the way uh particularly things like critical role or the adventure zone um have pushed narrative consumption as like the major output of a tabletop game which in many ways it is it's collaborative storytelling um but both in critical role which is almost entirely if not entirely they're all voice actors right they are all voice actors this is where todd admits that he's listened to half an episode of critical role before i am probably the resident critical role expert it's fine (laughs) um and the mcelroy brothers because i listen to a lot of the adventure zone um they are also trying to perform for an audience not only themselves and each other but for an audience that will hear this later and so pushing this like big narrative we want to have ups we want to have downs we want to have a nice climax um is something that people are hearing more as they're being more like inundated with dungeons and dragons um stuff which is cool um to say like how can we tell interesting stories in this medium that is about collaborative storytelling uh but it also puts some pressure on people to also perform um all the time as opposed to say play the game uh whatever that might mean like one of the weirdest biggest hurdles i keep coming i keep running into with new players because i i really enjoy teaching the game so i play with people who are totally new to it a lot is actually voice acting. And I worry sometimes that like the prevalence of actual plays today has fed into this where like it gets a lot of people very nervous to be like, I have to come up with like a voice that my character sounds like. And then I got to be ready at the drop of a hat to like talk as them, which is like hard to do if you're not a trained performer with some experience like that's a lot more steps when you're already conjuring an entire world in your imagination and like taking in the information the gm is giving to you and formulating a response that's supposed to be through the lens of the specific character that you already went through a tax form to like fill out (laughs) then then you have to be like okay but also what's their speech pattern like it's all it's a lot and reassuring new players that's like you don't 
you do not have to speak in first person if that's like not comfortable for you. You don't have to have a unique voice. It's just, you know, it can just be an imaginative venture of like, oh, I think Joe the fighter would say something like this. Yeah. And they just like let it go because that's like that decision is what kind of moves the story forward. It doesn't have to be performed because you're not if you're playing at home, you're not performing for an audience or you're not performing for an outside audience. We've talked about how you're all kind of performing for each other, but there isn't that same pressure. Yeah, I've definitely played in groups. Um, And this is actually really a lot of times if I'm just playing with my friends, my personal preference, I don't want to role play every single interaction with the bartender. Um, I don't want to have to ask in character how much an ale costs. Um, I think that's I am also I will admit um, the player who sits and stacks dice while they wait for combat to happen sometimes. (laughs) Um, That is is my archetype. Um, Yeah, I I think they're related. There can be this pressure that in part comes from the fact that D&D has become so popular again because of actual play podcasts and Twitch streams. Um, that emphasize this storytelling element to make it interesting to watch when you're not actually playing. I think there is this emphasis on creating scenes and having role play moments with other people at the table, you know, whether it has to do with backstory or not, like these these elaborately acted out emotionally moving and impactful scenes that not everybody is comfortable improvising. Um, Not everybody necessarily is able or wants to do that at their home table. And I think that that is, is interesting. Um, because sometimes also you have people who are super interested in doing that and they happen to be at a table with dice stackers. And and it's a a strange kind of double standard in D and D that I've grown it grown, like increasingly itchy about in the last year or two, um, where, you know, GMs will often ask, people okay if you're if you're trying to you know talk your way past a guard or do anything in that kind of social realm um you know people will often ask the players okay well what are you saying to them like how are you how are you doing this which which isn't a bad thing especially if you know that the players are kind of into that acting uh style of play that can be great um but where it does get a little tricky is that there's a long history in D&D of people like giving situational bonuses or that kind of thing for role playing, which I think can keep out a lot of people who aren't as comfortable with that. And it's an odd double standard because it's like, okay, so you're playing a character who has an 18 charisma score and is trained in uh, what we call in fifth edition in persuasion. Um, So like you're, you're a great smooth talker. You're like very convincing that's something that's true of your character. So you should not have to like yourself be an amazing smooth talker to play that character the same way that I, when I play Gavin, the glorious, you know, I can't stab someone with a rapier, but Gavin knows how to do that. So like, that's, that's enough. And I feel like the same should hold true in the kind of social sphere. Totally. I mean, I think there is, um, as a rookie GM, uh, who is running my first campaign right now, one of the things that I enjoy with the people that I play with is because a number of them are very theater focused and a number of them are performers among other things. Even if someone isn't a smooth talker, sometimes they will like, and then I say this and they'll like throw out an absolutely like ridiculous batshit line that should not work. And then their dice says it does. And we're like, OK, cool. Narratively, how do we explain that? Like <laughs> your come on to this guard was like, hey. And that's it. Like, <laughs> how do we how do we um And like folding that into the narrative, because I think that that's what makes it more fun is not like, oh, you must perform this in the most blah, 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 like whatever, man. Um, But instead focusing on like, okay, this is what you said you wanted to do. This is how the dice uh, rectify that. Like, cool, great. It's canon. How do we go forward? I I think you have to be really intentional about how you apply it, but I think it's, I think it's arguable how well D&D does social role play encounters because it is such a tricky thing to find the balance of like, this is what I am saying in character in a conversation with you. And maybe the DM has adjusted the DC 
of whatever check I'm eventually going to make based on what I am saying to you. But also there is this mechanic of like, we have to roll a die to see what happens um, and, and later justify it. And I think it is nice to have both options. Cause I know as a DM, like in the last campaign that I ran, my players ended up getting in this enormous real time hour long argument with my big bad uh, about uh, socialism. They, have start, they started referring to him as evil Bernie Sanders, which is a separate, a separate thing. But, um, you know, we, like they, we spent an hour and a half negotiating the terms of a contract essentially is, is what we were doing. They were criticizing his business acumen, which, you know, I have no business acumen. So my character did not have any business acumen. Um, but I think it is, up to, I, th- I think that's one of the things that a DM or a GM has to be really flexible about in terms of like, when do I apply the mechanic to have something very certain um, so that a player who is not super comfortable with trying to seduce a guard or whatever can just say, I want to roll this die. I want to roll this skill. Um, but then people who are super into that and have a lot more fun being able to play things out have the option of, of trying to do that. Because I think that is also a way to be more inclusive at at the table because i think the issue that that nick has raised in terms of like expecting a certain level of of performing ability or or social acumen in order to play a character is kind of exclusive to people who are neurodiverse or people who are not super well versed in social cues or have trouble picking up on um norms that that apply to everyday life that we then put into role-playing games the cool thing about having a dice mechanic, but also having the freedom to just play something out is, is really nice. And I think it just falls to a DM or a GM to gauge what the table wants, because that's really what almost every tabletop issue boils down to is what does your table want and what contributes to people having fun. Similarly, when you go to see a play, the fun thing is for the narrative to resolve and for things to have peaks and valleys and and for things to to proceed in, in a way that is enjoyable to watch and narratively interesting. Like, I think we enter these experiences with an expectation that we will enjoy them. And the thing to be prioritized is not what is quote unquote, right. But is uh, fulfilling that expectation of, is this a thing that I had fun doing? It's just like one final different thought maybe that we don't need to elaborate on. Um, I, I think an interesting part of role-playing games um so like there's a lot of theater that we will go see and i don't i wouldn't say that i enjoy tragedy on stage um but like you see it and you feel it and you get catharsis out of it like i've never enjoyed death of a salesman I will not enjoy Death of a Salesman, but there are productions that I've seen that are very cathartic. Um, And I think something that's interesting about role playing games, as opposed to other games, is that there's this weird space between like enjoying the game and enjoying the emotional catharsis that you get from the game and sometimes those things don't align which i think is fascinating like sometimes there are moments uh, that as a, a performer audience player something terrible happens to uh the characters that you're invested in to the people that your character cares about and it can be wonderful. Like that can be wonderful, which is very different from like how we would typically describe enjoying a game and like having fun at a game. Um, And so that's just, I just want to like, boop. That actually reminds me of an anecdote that if you feel, I would love to briefly share um, where at one time uh, my, my players were in this kind of gladiator arena type, type situation. And the first trial that they had to encounter was I had them play capture the flag essentially. And I, we had six people in the party and I split them three and three and they played against each other, which as it turns out was a terrible idea. Um, cause it got, uh, contentious. It got really, <laughs> uh, like we had to, when it was all over, we all had to stop and be out of character for five minutes and shake it out and like, make sure that we were all okay with each other as people. Because when you pit, player against player it's really really hard to have it stay like oh we're characters playing against each other and there but there also was there was a moment of catharsis of like oh like we have uh 
experienced interpersonal conflict with each other in a way that is confusing um, because those layers are getting blurred. But also, this is a this is, doesn't matter. It's capture the flag in a pretend game. But yeah, I think that anecdote kind of sums up like those different layers and what that can mean and and be. But yeah, that was also the the night that I almost tore my D and D group apart. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think that is a great example. Like the perhaps the characters don't care super a lot without knowing the characters or the situation. I can't speak of this, but I can imagine that maybe the characters don't care super a lot about who wins this game of capture the flag. But as a player, when you're playing a competitive game, <laughs> you do. <laughs> I got to the point where I it happened that we had split the teams in such a way that the three people, three of the kind of fighty non magic user characters were all wearing T-shirts and they were all on a team together. And the three magic users were all wearing short sleeve button downs and they were on a team together. And that evening, I, the DM, happened to be wearing a short sleeve button down. And I was very seriously accused of favoritism because I was wearing the same shirt as Team Magic. (laughs) So that if that gives you a sense of, of how of how real this uh pretend game that we were all playing got um amazing yeah right sounds like a good place to leave it awesome thank you so much for tuning into dungeons and drama nerds we'll see you next week with another installment of our campaign of dungeons and dragons Dungeons and Drama Nerds is produced by Todd Brian Backus, Percy Hornack, and Nick Orvis, and is mixed and edited by Anthony Sertel-Dean. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at DN Drama Nerds. Check out our cast bios on our website, DungeonsAndDramaNerds.com, and tune in next week for another episode of Dungeons and Drama Nerds. Dungeons and Drama Nerds.